The values that we hold are free speech. Free speech and allowing civil discourse. And it's our responsibility to have differences of opinion be aired. So we're sort of putting a bunch of people in a, in a pressure cooker and saying, OK, now everyone get along. It's going to take a lot of uh, hard work and effort by a big team and a lot of money, but uh, it's something we're committed to and excited about. Hello and welcome to University Beat. I'm Denise White. American universities have long been bastions of free speech, places where ideas, including those deemed unpopular, even radical by some, can be shared and debated. Conservative journalist Milo Yiannopoulos recently spoke on USF's Tampa campus. His appearances elsewhere have sparked disruptive protests. That didn't happen here, even though some students weren't happy about Yiannopoulos being invited to speak. Our Mark Schreiner reports. Members of USF's chapter of Young Americans for Liberty say they weren't looking for controversy by inviting the editor for the conservative-leaning news website Breitbart to campus. Instead, they said they were trying to start a conversation. Not necessarily the, oh, I'm right and you're wrong, he's wrong and I'm right sort of deal, more to say, why do I think this way? Why do you think this way? Have a civil discussion about it. But that discussion never really took place. About 500 Yiannopoulos fans packed the Marshall Center Oval Theater for the speech, held the same evening as the first presidential debate. The event ended up being equal parts Donald Trump pep rally and Hillary Clinton bashing session. What is she wearing? What is she wearing? As some of Yiannopoulos' previous speeches on college campuses have been interrupted by groups that denounce him as anti-feminist or racist, security was heavy for his USF appearance. However, a small group of protesters stayed outside the Marshall Student Center, voicing their displeasure. Uh, the main focus is, you know, uh, it's not to like disrupt, but the main focus should be to like sort of show administration, show Milo that their voice isn't welcome on campus, or that his voice isn't welcome on campus. And Butler added uh, that the protest uh, wasn't about shutting down free speech, it was about protesting what he calls Yiannopoulos' hate speech. He, he calls like feminism a cancer. He uh, he uh, spreads like homophobic uh, sort of language. He's like openly racist and Islamophobic, and so we don't think like that sort of thing should be promoted on campus. USF officials disagree to the extent that silencing such a speaker goes against what higher education should be about. The policy for academic institutions, the values that we hold, are free speech free speech and allowing civil discourse. And it's our responsibility to have differences of opinion be aired, and those that wish to listen can listen, and those that don't, don't have to attend. And so this was a difference of opinion for many. And Hoskins so admitted that, that there probably were safer speakers his group could have invited to USF, but they wouldn't well draw the else. kind of attention it's that Yiannopoulos that. does. If you don't have that kind of notoriety, people aren't going to care. And to really start conversations, people, one, have to care, two, they have to show up, and three, they have to get themselves to start questioning, why is this person coming here? For University Beat, I'm Mark Schreiner. USF St. Petersburg has placed well in two recent college rankings. The website collegechoice.net rates the campus's MBA program as number three in the state, right behind the University of Florida and the University of Miami. And another online ranking, this one by environmentalscience.org, says USF St. Pete is number one in Florida among environmental science schools. The campus placed 14th among schools nationwide. Over the summer, we reported on a large research project in the Gulf headed by the College of Marine Sciences. USF students and faculty members spent 40 days at sea taking samples from sediment, plants, and sea life affected by the 2010 Deepwater Horizon oil spill. They also sampled areas hit by a 1979 spill near Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. 
They hoped test results from that earlier spill would offer clues about the long-lasting impact of the Deepwater Horizon disaster. And the fact that there is still oil in these environments 37 years later is pretty remarkable. Um, in some cases, we found these tar balls that you would break open, and there was still liquid portions inside. So it hadn't even been touched by the bacteria or, or the sunlight or the, the wave action to, to break it down. And in areas where mangroves should be growing, the land was barren, with oil-based coating found a few inches below the sand. How to prepare for a trip to Mars? NASA has been trying to answer that question for years. And not only about the science involved, the agency also is studying the very human side of what would be a three-year round-trip journey to the Red Planet with the help of a USF researcher. Three, two, one. Come on. Come on. It's my turn. Last August, six scientists emerged from a year of living together in complete isolation. Their home was a two-story geodesic dome built among old lava beds in Hawaii. The habitat contained everything they needed, just not much room. They each had a tiny bedroom, but shared the rest of the space, including workstations, a kitchen, and an exercise area. And in order to fully experience life on Mars, they even had to wear spacesuits each time they left the habitat for a walk on the rough Mars-like terrain. A USF psychologist is part of the group that's analyzing the personal side of the experiment. Teamwork and dealing with conflict are important factors in planning such a long space mission. Dr. Wendy Bedwell monitored the scientists while they were in isolation and interviewed space each of them after the study there. ended. The type of people who are going to volunteer to do this are highly committed to what they're doing. So they're going to want to do the science. They're going to want to do the exploration. That's an inherent part of them. Getting along with others is something that's difficult for a lot of people, especially when you're in an isolated, confined, and extreme environment. So we're sort of putting a bunch of people in a, in a pressure cooker and saying, OK, now everyone get along. And it's just hard to do for extended periods of time. So that's why NASA is very interested in us trying to predict when there's going to be problems so that we can stop them before they get really big. The year in the simulated Mars habitat was the third and longest mission yet. Bedwell was also involved in an earlier eight-month-long mission. She says there were differences in how each crew found ways to cope. So what worked actually quite well for the eight-month crew was to avoid each other. They actually made um, the relationship aspects a task. So, okay, today Jack and Joe cannot work together. They're just not going to have that happen. So we're going to try and figure out how we can get all our tasking done and not have Jack interact with Joe. What we're initially seeing from the 12 month is that they actually relied on um, uh, pairs of people to really kind of provide social support for each other. And there was a bunch of different pairs that formed. Some were about tasks. Two people just worked really well together. So the crew would just try and arrange so that those two people could do a lot of the tasks that involved heavy amounts of teamwork. Um, and there were some people that couldn't work well together. So the crew just said, okay, we're just going to make it so that these people, when they have to do something together, it's not going to be really intensive in terms of how much I need to depend on you. Because long periods of time, they just get on each other's nerves. There's conflicts, uh, relationship conflict, like I just don't like you personally. And then there's task conflict, where we disagree about how we're supposed to do something. I think it's supposed to be done one way, and you think it's supposed to be done another way, and the two of us are supposed to be working on it together. And both of those types of conflict occurred with our eight-month and our 12-month crews, which again is very normal over an extended period of time, especially when you're in such an isolated and confined environment. The scientists found ways to break the stress of living together in such close quarters. The use of humor, actually. Um, one of the crew members sort of took the role of uh, being the jokester. And if things got really intense, would do something silly just to add levity to the situation. And that really seemed to help diffuse any situation because if one person starts laughing, everyone else kind of starts laughing as well. They would have salsa dancing night to kind of blow off steam, which I thought was interesting. Uh, didn't see that one coming. <laughs> Although the researchers involved are not astronauts, each seemed willing to consider it. 
NASA teamed up with the University of Hawaii for the project. Two more similar training missions are planned. USF Sarasota Manatee Campus will begin offering a master's degree in social work next fall. The program will be overseen by the School of Social Work on the Tampa campus. The master's program will involve eight semesters with classes mostly at night to accommodate working students. The course of study will include an internship. Only 25 students will be admitted to the program. USF's police and emergency management department staged a Campus Safety Awareness Day last week. It was part of a national campaign and came during Campus Safety Awareness Month. The idea was to have students, staff, and faculty make safety a top priority. Safety awareness all times, not just at this event, but we hope that they walk away with some new information perhaps that they didn't know and that they can take that way to their daily lives. There's a great opportunity to learn about a lot of things here today. For example, this is KP, uh, Campus Safety Awareness Month. We chose to express it in different ways that other universities are doing it. People can choose to express that day in any way. Some people celebrate the entire month. Some people do a week campaign or they do a day-long campaign. Our campaign was just half a day. Um, next year we hope to expand it, but we bought all aspects of safety in, whether it's health safety, food safety, law enforcement safety. Today it's about walking away with something different that you may not have when you came here today. Representatives from on campus and nearby agencies were on hand to answer questions, pass out information, and demonstrate best safety practices. Back in February, on our very first University Beat, USF President Judy Ginshaft indicated how strongly she supports students studying abroad. The other item that I wish will happen, um, every student whether you're undergrad or grad, will have at least one international experience. As a matter of fact, when students are accepted and they receive at to USF and they receive their uh, portfolio of acceptance, in there is a passport application because we have funds to help people travel internationally. They may even do their internship internationally. USF World supervises and counsels students who study overseas. Chris Haynes is an educational broad advisor, and he joins us now on University Beat, and welcome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Why the emphasis on studying abroad? Well, we want to provide this opportunity to all students at USF. Um, the world is ever-changing, you know, the world economy is growing, and, and we want to get our students in touch um, with the rest of the world, and so we do that through experiential learning overseas and through study abroad. And how many countries um, are, is the school involved in representing? Um, currently, it does fluctuate a little bit, but right now we're over 30 countries. Um, you know, we're on about 150 different programs in total. So, so are these research projects, general studies, or specific areas of learning? Um, it's all of the above. Uh, we have research projects. We have service learning components. Uh, we have your traditional study abroad models. Um, we even do exchanges with other partner institutions around the world. So it's a broad scope for, for study abroad here at USF. So if a USF student wants to study abroad, how does the process work? Um, it's really um, independent. You know, it's one of those things where they really lean on us to provide that insight because each student's going to be different. Um, some students come to us with, hey, we really want to study marine biology at the Great Barrier Reef. Fantastic, let's make that happen. Or other students are maybe a little bit more constrained financially, so we'll take that aspect. So as long as they come to us, um, my office is in the Marshall Student Center, um, to give them more of a central hub to, to come talk with us about their options for study abroad. And then we guide them from there through those initial, um, those initial conversations. Um, but they can also go to one of our study abroad events that we almost have on a daily basis. Um, we average about one a day. So there's all sorts of information out there that we want them to start with. So the world being what it is and violence, terrorism abroad, there's got to be a concern about safety. How do you Most address definitely. that? Most definitely. And uh, we have a fantastic risk and security team. Um, ben Chamberlain kind of oversees that project. And um, he makes sure that all of our students are prepared um, prior to studying abroad. Every student that goes on one of our programs does have to go through a pre-departure process. Um, that includes a riveting three-hour module that they have to complete online. Um, but it's specifically desi uh, designed to get them to, um, or to help them while they're abroad, to make sure they're making good decisions, that they understand the, the climate in the country that they could be studying in. Um, and we provide all that information to the students before they go. 
The last time we want is an instance to occur where they don't know what to do. Um, so we prepare our students um, through that process. On any given semester, how many USF students are studying abroad? So um, total, so annually we send about 1,700 students right now. Um, I would say our summer is our most popular time. That's when the majority of students study abroad. There's a little bit more flexibility with their classes. Um, but also our faculty lead those programs. So it's a really unique opportunity to go with their professors abroad and study a wide variety of different academic topics. Um, and in the summer, we send between 900 and 1,000 students. So the majority of our students are going during that time, um, if not more. And on the other hand, mm -hmm. foreign students come through this program here yeah. to USF. With just under 5,000 international students on campus, how does that compare to other universities of our size? Well, our, our intake with that amount of students is one of the top in, in the state of Florida, and we rank in the top 50 nationwide for international students attending USF. What's the most surprising thing you've heard from the international students about what they've experienced here, what they think about America? Um, that's a really, really good question. I think, I think kind of helping them through the, the football process. You know, they don't understand it quite yet. Um, uh, we had a fun conversation trying to explain tailgating to a few students, and it just wasn't clicking, and it was one of those like, you know what, you just gotta go do it. <laughs> and after they did it, they were like, hey, this is great. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. You know, we had no idea. You know, they get up early, they support the Bulls. Um, so it's a really cool process, and watch them to, you know, uh, have a really good time with the little things like that too. Um, so that was a fun experience. With the number of international students coming here and USF students going abroad, what's the benefit? What's the benefit of that kind of exchange internationally between right. these groups of students? And, and there's, a, there's a ton. And I think it's really easy to romanticize, you know, the study abroad or even incoming um, exchange or international student experience. Um, yeah, there's going to be these cultural learning process and you're experiencing different cultures. Um, but I think one of the things we're trying to move into is employability. We want to get our students jobs and we really believe in this process on both ends. We want them to understand that there are um, employment opportunities that directly correlate with a study abroad experience. Um, there's so many groups and organizations on this campus, it's fantastic. Um, but if you really want to separate yourself, you really want to get out there, study abroad is a great way to do that. Um, about less than 10% of students um, that are undergrads study abroad nationwide. Um, and Florida is really struggling with their numbers as well. So we want to change that. It looks really good on a job application. It does. It? it does. And it, it's beyond amazing is what we like to talk about. You know, when students come back, it was amazing. Yeah, but why? You know, so we want to extract those ideas so they can talk about it in an interview um, and, and really make the most of that opportunity. Chris Haynes, thank you so much for being on University. Thanks we for appreciate it. Me. Appreciate it. This week marks a huge event in USF history. On October 10th, 2014, Pam and Les Muma gave $25 million to the school's College of Business. That was and is the largest single gift in the university's history. The school is now known as the Muma College of Business. USF last week honored a man considered to be one of the school's founding fathers, True. Tampa attorney John World F. Germany, along with former Governor Leroy Collins and state representative, later Congressman Sam Gibbons, worked as a team to establish USF. Less Germany's more. contributions are now commemorated Graduate. with the renaming of a park on the campus outside the main library. Germany's son says the location is especially fitting. Uh, Dad had two really great civic passions, and one was libraries, and the other was promoting you know, access to education. So it's certainly very befitting that this park is next to the USF Library and, and, and an institution of which he was so very proud. In 1956, Germany, then Collins' chief of staff, helped Sam Gibbons craft the legislation that created USF and obtained the land on which the school was built. USF President Judy Genshaft said it's important to remember the people who laid the foundation for the university. They set the base for us and the values and their traditions and the seal of truth and wisdom. So history is absolutely meaningful, particularly in an academic institution, and they did a superlative job. USF's primary entrance is named Leroy Collins Boulevard and USF's Alumni Center is named after Sam and Martha Gibbons. 
John F. Germany passed away in 2015 at the age of 92. Infections are the scourge of hospitals and other medical facilities everywhere, and the bacterial infection, MRSA, is one of the nastiest infections there is. It is antibiotic resistant and it can be deadly. But some USF researchers say there may be hope coming from what at first might seem an unlikely source. Hedel Gandhi has our story. Although doctors have been using antibiotics to treat bacterial infections since the 1940s, bacterial disease remains one of the leading causes of death worldwide. Methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA, is one of the most dangerous bacterial infections because most of the drugs used to treat it quickly become ineffective. Methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, or MRSA, uh, is probably the most well-known of the antibiotic-resistant bacteria developing resistance to almost every new antibiotic in the clinic within about 12 months, um, resistant to almost everything that we have available to us, um, and kills tens of thousands of people every year in this country. And so uh, a serious problem killing an awful lot of people with very few treatment options. Uh, methicillin has sort of been the uh, drug, uh, main drug for treatment of Staphylococcus aureus. And with uh, increasing resistance towards antibiotics, it has now become, Staphylococcus aureus has now become resistant to methicillin. And so there's very few treatment options anymore uh, for these MRSA infections. There's only one drug that, that is currently still effective, and it's um, vancomycin, and it still um, has a number of strains that are resistant to it. MRSA is a uh, very um, important uh, public health concern uh, in terms of coming up with new treatments for it. What makes MRSA especially dangerous is its ability to attack all parts of the body. So most bacteria will cause one or two kinds of infections and do them well. This is a bacteria that can cause infection everywhere and do it well. And so um, it's almost unique amongst the bacteria in that it can cause infection in the brain, heart, bones, joints, lungs, liver, uh, anywhere in the body really. Years ago, MRSA was found primarily in hospitals and nursing homes. It's still a problem for those areas, but today, MRSA can also be found in gyms, locker rooms, and schools. So MRSA is uh, present uh, throughout the environment. Uh, you probably have some on your skin, uh, and this is part of the problem is once you breach the skin, you get a cut or something, uh, you can introduce those bacteria into your bloodstream and, and it can, can go out and, and infect you. Baker and Shaw have been working together for about six years, looking for a treatment that could overcome MRSA's ability to mutate and develop resistance. Shaw in the laboratory and Baker as director of USF Center for Drug Discovery and Innovation. These sponges and corals and tunicates and things, as you might imagine, living in the sea, they're surrounded by bacteria all the time. The seawater is, is, is uh, an intense bacterial environment. And so sponges and corals and, and the like have their own natural defenses. These defenses are different than, than humans' defenses. So humans have uh, an immune response, right? So we have antibodies and things that, that attack uh, bacterial infections. Uh, animals like sponges and corals don't have immune systems, but instead they make antibiotics. They make drugs for their own defense. And so by going out into the, these environments and, and bringing those organisms back into the lab, we can isolate their, their natural uh, treatments for infections and, and we can use those for, for our own use. Specimens are brought back to Shaw's lab where extracts are made and tested against MRSA. According to an article Baker and Shaw co-authored in the Journal of the American Chemical Society, an extract taken from a sponge shows amazing promise, killing more than 98 percent of the MRSA cells. But there is still much work to be done. It has uh, structural features that make it look like it's not going to be very bioavailable. It's not going to distribute in a, in a, in a human very well. Uh, it's probably not going to be absorbed by the human very well. So one of the things that we have to do is to modify it in the laboratory. So we do chemical synthesis, not only to, to make the whole molecule, because in fact we can't go back to Antarctica every week when we need more sponge, right? pretty far away. So in fact, we want to do a synthesis of the molecule 
uh, to have more material to study. But in the process of developing that synthesis, we will develop analogs of that molecule and try to make it more drug-like. So realistically, uh, at, at this stage of our research project, um, we could expect perhaps another 10 to 15 years before we will actually have a molecule that is suitable as a drug and has been through all the toxicity testing and, and um, you know, the types of, of experiments that one has to do to make sure that a, a new molecule is safe. It's going to take a lot of uh, hard work and effort by a big team and a lot of money, but uh, it's something we're committed to and excited about. For University Beat, I'm Hedel Gandhi. If you'd like to comment on our show or suggest a story you'd like to see us cover, there are several ways to let us know. You can download the WUSF app. There's a contact link, just write University Beat in the subject line. You can also email us at WUSF.org. Our website is UniversityBeatTV.org. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by searching University Beat TV. And that's University Beat for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Denise White.